and welcome to this Feed Info webcast on Insects in Animal Feed, the inside story. I'm Ollie Theokaris, Head of Perspectives Content for Feed Info, and I'm going to be your moderator. So our webinar today has been developed with our partners in Viraflight, and we thank them for their support. So I'm going to explain a bit about how this will work, if you've not seen one of our webinars before. We've actually pre-recorded this session, but our speakers are online right now to take questions in the Q&A chat box on the right hand side of the screen. So if you post a question in the questions tab, they'll be able to type your response. So do ask away throughout the webcast. We're also going to be releasing a number of polls throughout. So if you want to share your opinions and see what others in the industry are thinking about this subject, then do participate in the poll tab. So to begin, I would like to introduce our speakers. We actually have four experts today within, with different roles within insect production. They were going to give us the inside story about insect ingredients for use in animal feed. So we have Liz Kutsos, president of Enviroflight, who will tell us a little bit about the industry as a whole. Eric Rudolph, who is a process engineer, to talk to us about how you produce insect ingredients. Elida Espinoza, an entomologist and basic R&D lead to talk specifically about black soldier fly larvae, uh, which are used to produce many insect ingredients. And Alejandra McComb, director of R&D and regulatory affairs to talk us through the current legislation landscape. So it's great to have you all here today. And I'm really looking forward to getting uh, a great overview of the industry. So why are we all here today discussing insects and animal feed? Well, a recent Rabobank report predicts that global demand for insect proteins could reach 500,000 tonnes annually by 2030, which is actually 50 times more than the 10,000 tonnes produced in 2020. And this level of growth is really exciting. So I feel, and I know a lot of people in the industry feel, that now is the time for animal nutrition and feed professionals to educate themselves on the benefits and challenges associated with using insect protein in feed. So today we hope to address these, uh, and I'm really excited to get started and delve deep into this subject. So I'm going to kick off by speaking to Liz Kutsos. Hello, Liz. Can you start by introducing yourself? Absolutely. And thanks for having us, Ali. I'm Liz Kutsos. I'm the president of Enviroflight. Um, we are a darling ingredients business, um, and our mission is to upcycle regionally available feedstocks um, using the power of the black soldier fly larva to create vital nutrition to feed animals to help feed the world. Um, we're the first commercial producer of black soldier fly larva in the United States, um, and we are heavily focused on our R&D and engineering program to help drive this industry um, to, to be able to achieve our mission. Fantastic. And I know that you've worked in this industry for a number of years, so it would be great if you could tell us, firstly, why the animal nutrition industry should be taking insects so seriously and really thinking about the impact they could have on our sector. Yeah, absolutely. There's a lot of reasons. I think first and foremost is that they provide excellent nutrition. So it's a great opportunity to supply essential nutrients to livestock species uh, and pets. Um, second, um, most species of animals, including humans, have actually evolved to eat insects as part of their natural diet. So while we can provide excellent nutrition by feeding insects, we can also provide appropriate forms of nutrition um, to which an animal may have evolved naturally. Um, additionally, I think um, it's important to note that black soldier fly larvae in particular um, can upcycle feedstocks. And so we can take things that coming from the food and the feed industry that have low value or maybe contributing to greenhouse gas emissions because they're going to the landfill and create that valuable essential nutrition. Um, and then finally, really the bottom line is that we need more protein to feed the growing population. In order to feed that population, we're going to grow more animals to feed those people. Um, and so insect protein becomes a sustainable uh, supplement to the existing uh, traditional agriculture supply chain that, that's feeding animals to feed the world. Um, we need to be considering all of our options to help solve this global challenge and insects just fit perfectly as one of those sustainable options. Fantastic. 
So some really good positive reasons there why we need to be thinking about this. I should mention to our viewers at this stage that throughout the webinar, we're going to be referring quite frequently to black soldier fly larvae as the insect of choice for insect ingredients. Now, the reasons why we're doing that, we'll discuss a bit later in this session, so look out for that. But what I want to find out now is to build on what you've just described. We hear that insects are the sustainable choice in terms of feed ingredients. But how true is this? You know, when you're comparing traditional and newer protein sources for animal feed and pet food, what are the real sustainability benefits of using insects? So first, like I said, you can eat the entire animal. So there, there's not a lot of uh, residues and non-usable ingredients when we grow insects to feed humans or animals. Uh, second, in general, insects use less feed and water to convert into biomass. That's in part because they're cold-blooded, so they don't have to use energy for thermoregulation like chickens or pigs or cows. Um, and it's in part because of their very, very fast growth cycle. Um, we can grow so many more populations of insects in an annual cycle than we can grow chickens or pigs or cows. Um, and so that the potential for, for massive protein production is that much greater. And then additionally, we can farm vertically. So if we think about landmass being restricted, um, essentially we can farm in 3D where many other species of animals don't have that opportunity. Um, and so we can be incredibly efficient in a very small footprint of land to create lots and lots of protein and energy. So given all these advantages, why are we not using insects in feed more widely? You know, what are the biggest barriers you mm -hmm. think feed producers have when it comes to utilizing insects in feed? Yes, yeah, so I think the first reason is, is regulatory requirements. So in the United States, we have an incredibly robust um, method to provi pr prove safety of an ingredient so that we can confidently feed it to livestock species or pets. Um, and Enviroflate has really taken a leadership role in, in running those safety studies under Alejandro's direction. Um, and we've really, we, we've got lots of dossiers in front of the FDA documenting safety, but until that's gone through the regulatory process, um, we, we're not available to feed all animals. Um, and so that's, that's kind of the first big barrier for any new ingredient entering the market. Uh, I think the second big barrier is volume. Um, so as I mentioned, we're the first commercial scale producer in the United States, and there's a number of companies commercializing globally but compared to the volume of other animal protein and plant protein sources, we have very, very low volumes. Um, so kind of the volume by the regulatory challenge means we have very limited market opportunities now, but the, the future is huge. And we know that with expansion of regulatory approvals and with expansion of commercial scale operations, there's going to be tremendous opportunity for insects and animal feed. So there's clearly a lot of potential here. Um, so Absolutely. let's talk a little bit about the big issue that I think impacts a lot of decisions in our industry, which is, of course, the money. What about the cost of insect products compared to other protein sources? How do they compare at the moment? So right now they're quite expensive. I would say that insect proteins tend to fall in kind of the ultra premium and niche protein categories. Um, and that's really, again, a consequence of where we are in the, the commercialization and development of the industry. Um, as our team talks about quite regularly, there is no playbook for how to do this, how to commercially raise these animals. So, so our team and other teams are working to understand how to optimize systems and efficiencies. And as you do that, costs come down. Um, and so the, the ultimate goal is to be much more cost competitive with more traditional protein sources. Um, but at the moment, it is, again, an ultra premium uh, opportunity. So what you're saying is, you know, these costs are likely to be reduced quite dramatically in the future. It's going to take a few years to get there as you scale up, but there's a lot of potential here to make it more economic. Absolutely. Yeah. Fantastic. Great. Well, a lot of potential there as well. So talk to me about the R&D behind a company like Enviroflight. You know, this is a relatively new sector. So when you're considering your research and development decisions, what areas are companies like yours investing in? Yeah. So we are incredibly proud of our R&D efforts and the, the focus and support we've put into it, led by our, our parent company, Darling Ingredients. They've been very supportive of our efforts in R&D. We focus very broadly on quite a number of areas. As I mentioned, the regulatory um, and safety kinds of projects that need to be done so that we can get ingredient definitions and get approval to feed. Um, that was probably kind of the first um, major focus area. 
engineering, um, optimizing our systems and our equipment um, to meet the needs of our animals and the needs of our customers is a huge, a huge amount of effort um, under the direction of Eric and other engineers on our team. Um, and then we have two kind of general areas that we focus on in our at our R&D center. Um, one is genetics uh, under the leadership of Alida. Um, and we are incredibly uh, focused on our genetics program, both to understand the power of the black soldier fly larva and what opportunities it may provide, uh, and also to create very strong populations for the future um, so that we are prepared for uh, inevitable change in feedstocks or climate or, or disease situations. And then finally, we, we put a lot of time into feedstock assessment. So as I mentioned, we really focus on regionally available feedstocks. And in order to understand how we can use those effectively in our feeding program, we have to do a lot of trials. Um, we have to understand the safety of that feedstock, how the insect grows on, it, on the various levels of that uh, uh, input, and then what's the finished composition so that we can make, maintain the highest level of quality in our finished product. Thank you, Liz. I think that's a great overview. And I think we all understand how much research and work has gone into getting uh, companies like Envirofite to this stage. Uh, so we'll come back to you a bit later on. But now an area I'd really like to hone in on is how we actually produce this protein. So I want to bring in Eric Rudolph. Uh, Eric, it's great to have you here. So can you just introduce yourself to us uh, and also tell us a bit about your role? I'm Eric Rudolph, and I'm a process engineer for Envirofite. Um, I've been on the team for eight years now, um, back when Enviroflight was a small company um, with around 10 employees. Um, that's when I started. And uh, since then, I've been involved with the continued growth of the company, um, starting off with a pilot plant in Ohio um, to prove our concept and then recently the two specialty feed production facilities in Kentucky. So we've heard a bit about black soldier fly larvae and the fact that companies like yours are in the process of scaling up and you've talked about how you've helped the company grow. So yep. how do you go about raising huge quantities of larvae at one time? Yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's tough. At our production facility, we have billions of larvae um, converting commercial food waste into valuable feed ingredients. And so I've been involved in designing the uh, custom trays that we grow the larvae in, um, as well as the methods that we use to feed and water the larvae. Um, and all those organisms eating that food generate a lot of heat. So one of my jobs is to develop models to predict how much heat um, they're generating and how to get rid of, rid of that heat so the larva can grow quickly and stay healthy. Um, in order to do that, we need to keep a close eye on the environmental conditions in our facilities and be alerted of any problems that arise. So we have um, networks of hundreds of monitoring sensors that uh, allow us to maintain tight control of temperature and humidity. So, uh, Eric, can you actually tell us where these insects actually come from? How do you go about producing all of these organisms? Right, it's not as easy as you'd think. Um, the focus begins with the breeding side to make sure that we uh, have the flies producing the eggs that we need. Um, and so we have custom breeding cages uh, and laying substrates um, that we've developed starting with small scale for research and scaling up to full production. Um, and each of those components of the process are critical for quality and product and good production levels. So thank you for that overview. If we're thinking about the full process, what do you as a process engineer do with the larvae once they're grown to turn them into the feed ingredients that we would use in formulation. Yeah, once the larvae are full size, uh, we dry them and we separate them from their frass, the leftover feed. Um, and so we have a bunch of processing equipment um, to produce our whole dried larva and defatted meals, such as presses, screeners, things of that nature. Um, 
So going forward, uh, we're going to be expanding our production um, by installing new breeding cages and equipment to allow us to grow more larva. Uh, and then along with that, we'll be scaling up our processing with more drying and pressing capacity. Um, and so, yeah, we're always improving and I'm excited to uh, help with the new developments we'll be putting into place in the next few years. I think as demand increases, you're certainly going to be in a position where, uh, you know, there's going to be some real growth in your role in your development um, of actually scaling things up. So it's a really exciting time. Thank you so much for your insight there, Eric. Um, and at this point, I think it would be great to bring in uh, Elida Espinosa. Um, hello, Elida. Can you introduce yourself and tell us what you do at EnviroFlight? Yeah, hello. So I'm Elida Espinosa. I also go by Ellie. I'm an entomologist and in charge of the basic R&D and genetics program at EnviroFlight. So the goal of our program is to continue studying the biology of the black soldier fly and monitor the health and performance of various populations uh, we're establishing as a part of our breeding program. So there's still a lot that we have to learn about the black soldier fly, specifically how to leverage some of the many qualities that make it really a great candidate for commercial production of an insect ingredient. So to put that into perspective, we can think about poultry, so specifically chicken. Traditional livestock like chicken have undergone great genetics improvements in the past 60 years. And a lot of that has to do with the advent of quantitative genetics theory and the combination of accessible molecular genetic tools. So in that combination, commercial chicken strains and crosses um, have been made and allowed for the production of specific strains that are at least four times larger than what was being produced. So this is a difference of um, that has occurred between 1957 to 2001 with continued improvements of about 3% per year. So these continued improvements have made it possible um, or have been made possible by collecting data. So this is both like the phenotypic measurable data that we have, the um, genotypic traits. So using genetic markers and analyzing all of that. And how we use this information is really what has revolutionized the breeding techniques and the breeding strategies that breeders use today. So looking at that type of a model of traditional livestock, here at EnviroFlight, we're trying to establish um, very much a similar program. So we have developed a variety of protocols to rear our black soldier flies, continue to learn about their population and mating structure, and ultimately really test breeding, st uh, breeding strategies so that we can establish and select specific traits um, with our specific black soldier fly strain populations. Thank you for that overview. Uh, it's clear that a lot of research has already, as I said, gone into what you're developing at the moment, but there's also so much more you can learn to, again, help scale things up. So I want to now ask the question that we referred to earlier. Why black soldier flies? Why are they used so extensively in animal feed above other insects? Can you give us some insight there? Yeah, so I think that's a fantastic question and one that many people are probably asking. Uh, and I think it's it's really thanks to their biology. So a lot of features and qualities that they just hold um, just because of their existence and, and the species that they are. So namely, we can think about what they eat, how they develop, and how they reproduce. So black soldier fly larvae, they're decomposers. Uh, they belong to a trophic level that is both uh, beneficial and sometimes notorious for breaking down, <clears throat> excuse me, waste materials into nutrients. Um, they're the recyclers of the world, just naturally. And so because black soldier fly larvae are these decomposers, uh, they had the advantage of being able to feed on anything and everything. So when you think about the potential feed stocks that you could um, use to rear them, really there's, there's a wide variety um, of what you can use there. And so because they're, again, decomposers, you can harness and leverage um, their consumption towards efficiency and really create a sustainable model of feed production. So relative to other insects that are being reared as animal feed, they require more specific diets. So there are some that are um, specific grain eaters like the mealworm and things like that, which really limit the sustainable source and then the feed that you have to feed them. 
And so just evolutionarily, the black soldier fly is adapted to consume a wide breadth of organic matter without much of a problem. And I'd say another one of the biggest reasons is um, that just their great ability to reproduce a lot of progeny really fast. And so if we think about it, a single male and female, um, so they live about seven to 10 days. Uh, they're, their only purpose is really to reproduce upon that, that time. So they don't do any feeding. Um, they'll drink some water sometimes, but they really are just ready to mate and lay eggs. So upon mating, a female will lay anywhere from 500 to 900 eggs. And those eggs will then hatch within about a two day period. And you start the entire cycle, which takes about 40 to 45 days for that egg to become an adult again. So all of that growing, it happens really fast, um, even relative to other insects. And it allows that cycle to start all over again. So this is, this is fast. And, and it makes the BSF be really the, the front runner insect entering the animal feed world when we're talking about efficiency and production capabilities. So you've described the life cycle there a little bit. Why are you using the larvae? You know, and for those who are not entomologists, can you actually tell us what a larva of a black soldier fly is so we can understand a bit better about uh, about that background and why you're using those specifically? Yeah, so the black soldier fly, it's an immature fly. So I feel a lot of people have the concept of uh, what a butterfly and how a butterfly matures. So you have your egg, you have your larva, you have a pupa, and then you have your adult. And so that larva is that immature uh, stage of those flies. So these guys are going through what we call complete metamorphosis. And by going through those four different stages, they're not competing with each other for food or rearing environments. So rearing environment and really the growth environment of an adult is gonna be very different from the larva. So again, we're talking about an evolutionary advantage that all other insects with complete metamorphosis have. And one that makes the black soldier fly specifically a better candidate um, for animal feed production and rearing. So other insects like the house cricket, for example, these guys go through incomplete metamorphosis. And so what happens here is that um, they don't necessarily have larval stages, but these immature stages, which we call nymphs, um, they molt and they eat this, uh, the same feed. So they're, they're growing in the same environment, eating the same feed through their entire life. So up to the adult stage, which really creates this indirect competition amongst all life stages. And this is another reason why the black soldier fly is really a great insect to, to be able to rear. That makes a lot more sense now. I think I remember studying, studying a bit of entomology in my university days and it's all started to come back to me. Never did I think, you know, 10, 15 years later, we'd be having these discussions. So it's really exciting that we're moving in that direction. Now, I do have a very important question for you that I know all the nutritionists, nutritionists and formulators watching are gonna be interested in. So mm -hmm. nutritionally, how do black soldier fly larvae products compare to other traditional and newer protein sources for feed? Great question. I think there's, there's several things that we should understand um, when we talk about black soldier fly and the products that we can produce from it. So black soldier fly products, which include your, your dried black soldier fly larva, whole or ground, uh, which then can produce the black soldier fly meal, black soldier fly oil, uh, these are all products that can be used in poultry, salmonid fish, adult dogs, swine, wild birds, and other insectivorous exotic species. So all of these potential animal consumers have different nutritional needs, and thus their diet formulations are not a one-size-fits-all. And so this is something that has to be understood by the consumer of the product. Um, and obviously we have to educate that consumer. So the black soldier fly larva products should be used in accordance with those nutritional needs specific to the animal consumer. But overall, as it compares to other protein products that are currently used in markets to those specific animals, um, our products have high concentration of essential nutrients. So insects in general are a good source of amino acids, vitamin E, carotenoids, important to the animal health and uh, the product marketability. So when you think about eggs, people care about the pigmentation of meat and eggs and insect ingredients, specifically the black soldier fly, help add to that. 
specifically if we talk about calcium um, we can think of it as uh, as the black soldier fly products having exception exceptionally high relative um, contents of calcium um, when compared to other novel insects being used uh, to produce insect ingredients and this also includes high amounts of essential fatty acids like uh, linoleic acid and lauric acid which is often um, a very sought after lipid so if we talk about maybe more traditional uh, soybean meal and fish meal this is these are products that black soldier flies larva products are also comparable with so in general the black soldier fly meal for example can replace a high quality animal protein like fish meal as a nutritional and digestible feed source so while newer protein ingredients are that are derived from um, like algae or single cell organisms like yeast uh, there can be sometimes issues with less digestibility specifically with algae mostly um, because they're more comparable to a legume protein which um, just in terms of, of the I guess the physiology of where the protein is coming from is different from that of an animal protein so single cell proteins like yeast which I just mentioned are reported to be highly digestible but they do lack significant fatty acids that in comparison to black soldier flies are are very present and and uh, in very high amounts so ultimately um, I guess just a specific black soldier fly products and their available nutrients I think will be highly dependent on the feedstock that it is grown on so pretty much what's coming in will definitely alter or change what could potentially come out so how the larva is harvested also affects the chemistry and um, of the final product and obviously its usability um, the processing method of the ingredient itself so understanding all of these elements of really what makes that final black soldier fly product is really going to um, help manufacturers better compare between traditional and more novel protein sources of feed thank you ellie so i've got one more person to speak to about a massively important issue alejandro mccomb can you please introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about your role hi i'm alejandro mccomb and i am the director of research and development as well as regulatory affairs here at enviroflight um, we do internal research um, our staff is at yellow springs and at the maysville facilities and they have different purposes um, this internal research can be applied into our manufacturing facilities and all the practices that take place. Um, it can help us to understand how to make use of unique or new feed inputs, and it allows us to achieve larvae and flies of a desired quality. Um, we also conduct external research in collaboration with universities and industry partners to understand how the black soldier fly ingredient works for animals and plants. And the regulatory side of my role involves ensuring that procedures used and products produced at EnviroFlight result in food that is safe and of a beneficial and consistent quality. Um, the efforts uh, are achieved by our quality assurance and our food safety teams at EnviroFlight and Darling Ingredients. So I want to focus in on the legislation because that is an issue that is constantly changing. There's some really interesting things going on there. So where can we currently use insects in feed around the world and for what species? Well, insects in food and feed are definitely nothing new, uh, especially in countries with longer human and agricultural histories. What has changed is the demand. Uh, now it's at substantial quantities because it's being used as an alternate ingredient to those commonly used for food animals and for pets. So to assure the security of the human food supply, the impact of feeding insects to pigs, poultry, and aquaculture, it's those species in particular have been very vigorously studied and regulations have been put in place to keep livestock and the products that they yield um, to a safe degree. So what can we expect next for the regulations? You know, what markets and species are changing their legislations in this area to open up uh, markets to insect products? Well, regulatory support for insect ingredients has been a gradual process, which has picked up momentum with time. Uh, multiple entities 
have had much to learn from the insect species, what they eat, how they are grown, and the processing that results in a variety of products. Off the continuous research done by EnviroFlight and others, we have compiled findings to provide reports substantiating the safety and efficacy of the black soldier fly larva to many animal species. Uh, most recently, the adult dogs, which may benefit from this novel protein for use in pets prone to food allergies. Um, also in the EU, we are expecting towards the end of this year that there will be an opening for black soldier fly insects and other uh, insect species to be offered to poultry and swine uh, based on some modifications to the regulations happening there. Um, I personally look forward to regulations also opening to a broader support of feeding of insects to, um, to zoo animals and other non-traditional pets that have adapted just for this type of food. An exciting time. I think there's a lot going on at the moment. And I know we were talking about the EU regulations before, and I think that is a really big step and offers so much potential uh, for those interested in these markets. Um, so, you know, there is still more evolution, I think, of the legislation required, but there's a lot of potential there and it's going in the right direction. I'm actually going to move away a bit from the regulation now because I have heard people express by security concerns about using, you know, animal protein for animal feed. Um, and it's something that different markets have different concerns about. But what do you do in the insect industry and what do you do in EnviroFlight to ensure your products are not a vector for diseases? So the ingredients that we source to feed our larva, those come from reputable ingredient suppliers and the full life cycle of our animal stock is grown in-house. Our finished products are processed to remain stable for the recommended shelf life before the bags and barrels are closed too. Many steps have already taken place to guarantee the quality of what's inside. Um, and all facilities, but definitely EnviroFlight, has ensured that not only are we registered with FDA, but that we have additional certifications that ensure to guide us on how to maintain that biosecurity and that quality. Um, so we, we follow approval plans, which take measures on biosecurity and pest control. Um, as an example, we assure that our staff and all of our visitors to our facilities have been appropriately quarantined if they have had contact with certain types of agriculture that could pose a threat. Um, so overall, all of these safeguards against disease in our animals and contamination in our manufacturing facilities and product lines ensure that we just stay. Um, this all safeguards against disease in our animals and contamination in our manufacturing facilities and production lines. Fantastic. Thank you, Alejandra. That was a great overview. So now I want to get everyone back on screen so I can ask a few follow up questions. Hello, everyone. Welcome back. Um, so thank you for your input so far. Now, firstly, I've got a follow up question for Liz. So we've talked a lot about the market legislation and specifically black soldier flies. So can you actually tell us a bit about the sorts of products that you can make from these insects? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I think uh, what we do now is just the tip of the iceberg in terms of product development opportunities. But but at this moment, we create three primary product streams um, and, and from the larva. So the first is EnviroBug, um, and then we make EnviroMeal and EnviroOil. So EnviroBug is the whole dried larva. Um, it's, it's typically right now fed to poultry. Um, as a, a, a really sustainable nutrient source and also to promote animal welfare. Um, it's really high protein, high energy, um, and again, kind of meets their natural feeding behaviors. But from a nutrition perspective, this is also a great opportunity for feeding to reptiles, to fish, and to pets, and to other species that would have naturally evolved to eat whole insects. Uh, when we make the Enviro meal and the Enviro oil, essentially, we press the fat out of that whole larva. And so we're left with a really high protein powder um, and that's the meal and then the, the oil source. Um, the Enviro oil has really high levels of lauric acid that Alita mentioned. Um, this is a C12 fatty acid, saturated fatty acid. Um, because of its really short chain length, it's very bioavailable to animals. Um, so really highly nutritious, excellent energy source and has some antimicrobial potential as well. 
Um, the only other naturally occurring sources of this fatty acid are coconut oil and palm oil. Um, and so we're really excited to have a more sustainable option for production of this fatty acid. And we've got some beautiful animal data supporting its value in uh, livestock production systems. Um, and then the meal, again, is kind of what, the, what drove the development of the insect industry in particular. Um, and so this is this very high protein uh, amino acid enriched product that can be fed to virtually any species of animal. Um, we've done testing in chickens and pigs and dogs and cats and, um, and fish and shrimp and, and you name it. And in any of those species, it provides a really highly digestible available protein source. Um, so, um, and again, I, I also will mention, I think Alejandro mentioned that the, it's a novel protein for pets. And so we're seeing a lot of interest in marketing that product to hypoallergenic, uh, for hypoallergenic diets for cats and dogs that may have food intolerances. We do have a fourth product um, strain and or stream, and that is the biomass that comes from the production of the larva. Uh, it's called frass, and it's really defined as the excreta of the insects and the exoskeletons, the sheddings that are created as the animals go through their instar stages. Um, this is a really nutritious um, uh, ingredient, um, and really the most focus has gone into its application as a fertilizer. So a uh, really nicely available source of nitrogen um, and phosphorus for plants, um, but not in a way that would contribute to water uh, quality issues or eutrophication of our watershed. Um, so, uh, and additionally, the chitin content in that frass uh, is theorized to have some really beneficial effects on soil microbiology. Um, mm -hmm. So we really focus a lot outside of the animal feed industry with our frass stream. It's great that you are able to use all different parts of the color, all the substances produced in the process, really. I think that's fantastic and just helps, you know, put forward the argument for sustainability and it being a sustainable option for people. I think it's really important to mention that, you know, we look at our um, we look at our process as essentially borrowing the nutrition from the feedstocks that we use, creating this really valuable protein and energy source and then returning that frass. Um, as a highly nutritious source of, of amino acids and protein and, and phosphorus back to the environment in a really sustainable way. I do have a big question which is associated with the ick factor. So some consumers wouldn't necessarily feel comfortable eating insects, but how do consumers react to animals fed with insects? Are there concerns about safety or the ethics of animals eating animals? Um, and Alejandra, I think you've raised your hand. Mm -hmm. Thoughts on that? Uh, no, I just uh, I wanted to jump in that I can totally testify to consumer views changing generationally. Um, my three kids have absolutely no qualms with larva in our pet's foods. They've learned by watching it and they now understand that our chickens, they actually prefer the dry larva to the earthworms that they find through the backyard after the storms. And our dog uh, and even our guinea pig also, they prefer it to the food that they have available. I think that exposure to the ingredient is going to be key as the educational component. They, folks just have to become aware that it's even around and what its purpose can be. No, I think you're absolutely right. I've seen my, um, my mother-in-law's dog happily chomp on an insect he finds when we're going out for a walk. So, you know, I think for, for, for kind of animals like that, if you're seeing them eat them in nature anyway, I don't understand necessarily why you would have an issue with that, but it's an interesting discussion. And I think you're right, as time goes by uh, and as generations go by, I think the ick factor will be reduced. Um, I'm gonna talk now a bit more about scaling up. We've referred to it quite a lot throughout this session. So our insect producers around the world on track to produce enough insect protein to actually replace other sources of protein that we're currently using in feed. So I'll take that one. Um, I guess from our perspective, we're not looking to replace um, protein because I think the world needs more protein in general. What we're looking to do is augment the available protein resources, maybe do it in a more sustainable way, particularly when we can talk about providing protein regionally and locally and not having to transport things, you know, halfway around the world to feed animals or, or humans. Um, and so, um, so, so I don't think we're trying to replace other protein sources, but I do think as the industry scales up, 
we are going to see vastly increasing quantities of insect-derived ingredients that can meet the needs and the demand of the pet food market and the agricultural markets. Um, so we're just excited to be part of a sustainable protein solution and not trying to knock anybody else out of the, the opportunity as well. I think that makes sense. And I've got another follow-up question on that then for you, Liz. Knowing kind of what and how other producers are growing insects, in five years' time, how much of the market do you think is going to be using insect feed? You know, what about in 50 years? Have you got any ideas or figures that might kind of tell us the direction that we're going in there? Yeah, and I think you and, and, and the other viewers probably are really aware of all of the press that insect-derived ingredients have received in the last four or five years. There's been tremendous investment in commercial-scale opportunities and, and development of new facilities and, frankly, new insects. So I think we are going to see rapid increases in the production and the volume of insect-derived ingredients. There's a recent report that suggested that pet food alone would, would consume 165,000 short tons of insect meal on an annual basis. That's, I mean, that's astounding. And, and the insect industry is going to have to rapidly scale up just to meet that need. So, you know, in five years, I think we'll see a, a strong presence in pet and aquaculture and start growing into other agricultural opportunities. In 50 years, I hope we're, I hope insect derived ingredients are commonplace in feeding programs for agricultural species, pets and humans. I wouldn't be surprised. I think it's receiving so much kind of movement in all the areas that we've discussed today. There is a lot going on. So it's a really exciting time. Um, I've got one final question. Uh, so what would you say to those in the animal nutrition and feed industry who are maybe wary about using insect products in feed? Who wants to tackle that one? I'll take it. Um, so, I mean, there's large groupings of water dwelling animals that feed on exoskeleton type animals, plankton, krill. We also eat lobsters and prawns and crabs. Um, but there's a great variety of land animals, mammals, birds, even other invertebrates that consume insects and they're called insectivores and they specialize in eating them as the main part of their diet. So it's, it's already appropriate for those animals to consume this ingredient and they've evolved to make use of it. Um, I was told, I looked it up, that human molars were evolved to eat insects also. So it's a natural way to get protein and energy to all kinds of species. It really is. And I think, as you say, as time goes by, I think as the ick factor reduces, we will, as you say, see hopefully humans moving back to a position where they are kind of considering insects as a suitable protein source. You know, the world population is growing quite dramatically and we need to do something. Uh, and if insects can be part of the solution, I think that that's going to be really beneficial for the future of the human race. And I think that's a lovely point to end on. So thank you to our fantastic speakers for your interesting insight into the minds and thoughts of some of the different perspectives from across this industry. It's been really great to get your opinions today and I've learned quite a bit about uh, the potential that we've got here. Thank you to everyone for tuning in and we hope you're able to join us for future webcasts and videos from Feed Info.